There are a number of challenges facing parents wanting to send their children to a Catholic college, not least among them is fidelity to church teaching and affordability. We'll talk about one college that is overcoming these challenges to highlight the opportunities and graces inherent in Catholic higher education. So please stay with us. Thank you very much and welcome on Father Mitch Packle and welcome to EWTN Live where we bring you guests from all over the world. We didn't have to go too overly far. Our guest tonight is working to make Belmont Abbey College in Belmont, North Carolina, which is just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, into a world-class institute of genuinely Catholic higher education. And in today's culture, that means, among other things, solving various problems such as governmental challenges to freedom of religion, as well as softening the economic demands on a parent's bank account as college tuition skyrockets. So please welcome our guest, who is the president of Belmont Abbey College and the author of the book, Less Than a Minute to Go, The Secret to world-class performance in sport, business, and everyday life. Please welcome Dr. William Tierfelder. Oh, Good to have you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Good to have you. Yeah, I appreciate being here. Well, you've got a little bit of a break before the rush of the new school year, as much of a break as yeah. an administrator has. Uh, when I was on faculty, summertime really was a break from teaching and such. It, it, it's a different kind of workload, you know. Yeah, during, during yeah. The, you, you get, I feel that wave coming back now. The students oh, are yeah. coming, but yeah, there's yeah. the work to do. And, I, and everybody may not know this, but my wife Mary and I have 10 children. So mm -hmm. life is full year round like it, yeah, it never stops yeah, uh, yeah. well that's you know, that's your own little college that, class that's our right own little uh, that's you know community schoolroom. our own little monastery yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How old is the oldest uh, she's 27 and uh, the youngest uh, nine nine so yeah. you got a big span yeah, there 18 yeah, years span. Yeah. and we just had our first granddaughter so uh, oh is that right yeah, congratulations yeah, nora so we're very we're, we're oh, thrilled that, and does her young uh, the, the young one, is that a girl or boy? A, a girl, Nora. Yeah, so yeah. Nora, so yeah. Nora, does she like being an aunt? Well, no, Nora, Matthew is the youngest. He's nine, he's the uncle. Okay. And Nora is the, the granddaughter. Okay. And uh, Matthew loves being the uncle, and so Good. does Luke and John and James and Thomas yeah, and yeah, yeah. Joseph. And, Finally, you know, the, the little group. guy gets someone to boss around. Yeah, no, nah, <laughs> you, you you, it was amazing to me how much they do love her already, you know. Oh, They're, that's they, good. You know, you didn't have no problem with who's going to hold her. Everybody yeah. wanted to hold her. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's good. Well, th we're, we're in a difficult situation in many ways with uh, higher education. Uh, for one thing, costs are amazingly skyrocketing. Yeah. Uh, I went to graduate school at Vanderbilt back in 1979 to 84. And for the two years I had to pay class tuition, mm -hmm. it was $4,200 a mm -hmm. year. And generally, I thought, well, that's expensive. That's a lot, yeah. But $4,200 is chicken feed right. compared to today. Yeah. And this is a, a major deal. Plus, trying to find a place where students are not going to have their faith attacked. It's one thing right. for challenges. It's another thing for attacks. Right. Well, let, let's Which, go on the positive side. Let's build it up. Forget being attacked. You know, we've got to figure out how do we incorporate and integrate it into education. There yeah. you go. So this is, what is your goal at Belmont? How do you see your purpose at Belmont College? Not just you as yeah, you, you yeah. personally, but for the, for the college. Well, you know, I'll start off with Belmont Abbey College. Uh, when I first arrived there now 12 years ago, which is hard for me to believe, uh, 
we wrote a, mission, a vision statement, and that vision statement begins with, Belmont Abbey College finds its center in Jesus Christ. So, okay. so you don't have to read the fine print, you don't have to look down to see where we're at. Mm -hmm. that, that is mm -hmm. the essence and the foundation of mm -hmm. why we're there. Mm -hmm. Our mission statement, uh, the very first sentence, only three sentences, but the very first sentence is a very powerful statement. It says, our mission is to educate students in the liberal arts and sciences so that in all things God may be glorified. So that's, that's yeah. the purpose of life. Right. So it's to glorify God. And as you know, St. Thomas Aquinas talked about money, power, fame, pleasure. And he said, if you don't have first things first, if you don't have God first in your life, those four things have the potential to become addictions because yep. you will never have enough money, enough power, enough pleasure, enough fame. You know? So it, you got to know your priorities. You got to know why you're doing what you're doing. And for me personally, I couldn't have committed my life to doing this if this was not for a noble, holy, good purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so the work that's being done there, uh, we have a monastery. Uh, mm -hmm. Abbot, uh, you don't run that though. No way. Abbot, <laughs> Abbot Placid runs that. He's the chancellor actually of the college as well. And uh, mm -hmm. Abbot Placid is a holy, good man, priest, abbot. Uh, he's brilliant. His doctorate's in patristics. Uh, we're Which just we're blessed to have him. Study of early church fathers. Okay, so, um, he's, so he's an expert. So modern in history is 500 fathers. and beyond. You know, yeah, so, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Share that. No, I know you're, with your <laughs> background, you know, uh, you, 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 we got to get you to come teach at the college maybe a little oh, bit, you know. A little busy, but go I ahead. I know, I know, but we'll find a way to work you in there somehow, you know. But uh, so, so our, that, that's our mission. I mean, that, that's the first sentence of it. Um, it continues, you know, emphasizing, well, before we get to emphasizing, um, we talk about the Catholic intellectual tradition, the Benedictine spirit of prayer and learning. Mm -hmm. And very often Catholic intellectual tradition, people say, okay, you know, wh what's that thing about? And it's basically about faith and reason. Yeah. And it's saying there's no conflict between faith and reason. God right. gave us the grace to have both. And uh, actually, St. John Paul II, as you would know better than anybody, uh, wrote a beautiful encyclical called Fides et Ratio, which is yeah, Faith and fact, Reason. Last year, we, we spent a year on that, okay. on my other's program, going through, because for that very reason, right. faith and reason belong together. They yeah. need each other. Well, actually, the, even that first, I may butcher this a little bit, you could probably correct me, but in that first paragraph, it almost describes everything that's in it. It says, you know, uh, faith and reason are like two wings upon which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. Mm -hmm. And God has placed in the heart the desire for man to know truth, which is in itself to know God, which means ultimately by knowing and loving God, we can come then as men and women to the fullness of the truth about ourselves. Exactly. And really, you know, that's the basis of a Catholic education is that you're, you're, you're understanding that, that working together of both faith and reason, reason by itself wouldn't be sufficient. Well, in, when we see people try to claim that reason is sufficient all by itself, that is itself an act of faith they cannot prove. <laughs> I love you, that. You, that's you, great. You, yeah. you can't yeah. prove that reason is even reasonable. Right. You know, that's inherently possible because you'd have to use reason right. to do so. So, you know, you make an act of faith that right. reason is good. And they are blind to that and they end up moving towards various forms of you know, relativism mm -hmm. that there is no truth. Right. Because they won't make an act of faith right. in it. And, that, and that's really what the education is about. It's about seeking the truth in, in whatever discipline. So it could that's be right. biology, it could be history, it could be English, theology, whatever. Right. We're seeking the truth and when we find it, we live in response to it. And so really this, this knowing the truth is like getting a little glimpse of God, mm -hmm. you know, because he is the truth with a capital T. And so those, those truths add up and you get a better and better insight and understanding of God uh, in terms of your studies. And so that, that's really what we try to do between our core curriculum a lot of people don't realize today a core curriculum is sort of considered um, sort of the general basis or foundation that you need uh, to really pursue anything maybe in a more, you know, directed way or, or detailed way. Yeah, at, at the college level, it's a, it's a number of courses. Assuming that you've had high school and grammar school, yes. now there's some core topics you have yes. to be able to be familiar with to move to the next level. Right. right? So, a, absolutely. And so, for example... Um, our students take two semesters of logic, grammar, and rhetoric, writing. Um, we have writing across our curriculum. They have two semesters of Western civilization, a semester of U.S. Constitution, um, two of government and political philosophy. <laughs> they, yeah, I know. They, they study the Constitution? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, they stopped using the Constitution as a textbook at the Harvard Law School during World War I. Really? And ever since. And other law schools have followed suit. So 
uh, either you are way backwards, <laughs> yeah. or what I really suspect is you're well ahead of We them. are. The Holy Spirit always knows the right answer, you know, so yeah. I'll, I'll go there. But yeah, so, so the, the, our core is a really solid core, and it really prepares you well, because in the end, you know, today I think the research is showing that this millennial generation is going to have something like 14 to 15 career changes. So how would, you, how would you prepare for just one career when you're gonna have 14 or 15? So mm -hmm. what's important is that you're, you, you're taught to be a critical thinker, that you're taught to be logical. You're able to clearly and compellingly articulate your ideas. You can write extraordinarily well. You can basically find solutions to problems, you know, whatever they might be. And so mm -hmm. really that's, that's the root and the basis of a really good education. And again, it's founded in the Catholic intellectual tradition and our understanding of truth. One of the things that is, I think, very important to dispel is the myth begun in the 16 and 1700s that the period when the church took over from the Roman Empire was the Dark Ages. And yeah. it, it was just the opposite. Unbelievable. Wasn't it? The uh, yeah. church brought intellectual pursuits with the faith yes. and didn't suppress it at all. Well, at, at one point in the Middle Ages, I believe there were something like 38,000 monasteries in, right. in Europe. And very often people think of Benedictine monks, which was what we have, they think of them as more the scriptorium. You know, they're there with the hoods and with their feathered pens copying on another right. volume of scripture, right. which of course they did. But what people don't realize is the contribution of the monastics to business, agriculture, astronomy, metallurgy, as you pointed out earlier, uh, astronomy. I mean, we could go on and on. It is profound. And so when we talk about Western civilization, which is this thing we live in, mm -hmm. this is where it came from. So they not only built it, they preserved it. And that's what Bellman Abbey College is continuing to do. So we're, we're not just there for 140 years. We're carrying on a 15, almost a 1,500-year tradition. Yeah, and that's uh, something that's very important to understand. The church has been committed oh, to yes. the intellectual pursuits with faith, reason and faith together, from its earliest right. years. And we don't try to suppress knowledge. A absolutely. We absolutely. try to suppress ignorance, right. but not knowledge. Right. And, it, and it's the understanding of truth. I mean, that's our, that's our challenge. Yeah. Now, w one of the things that we, we mentioned briefly is a problem that, you know, and this is a big issue in the um, uh, present election, and, mm -hmm. and uh, folks realize that we've got a huge problem of this increase. I think my alma mater has gone from $4,200 when I was there mm -hmm. to about 40 some thousand dollars right. today. And that tenfold increase over 30 years is way beyond inflation. inflation right. What are you doing to help parents and students not end up with a degree and an enormous debt? Right. And it's really important, I mean, that we do yeah. this, especially, you know, for Catholic families. I mean, for everybody, but especially for Catholic families. Um, what we did is about three or four years ago now, I actually lowered our tuition by 33%. Whoa. So you talk about going against the grain. Yeah, um, yeah. And so our total tuition cost was $18,000 now. Um, 18000 Yes. That's remarkable. You know, I I've served on you know, a university board and I'm aware of comparative mm -hmm. prices around the country. That's one of the best right. prices. But I've let me go, let me go, let me do one better. Come on. I, okay. I'm the son of a used car salesman. <laughs> what you got for a deal? Okay. Well, here's uh, what I started to see is that, uh, as I just said, I'm a family, you know, 10 children, we homeschool. And I saw a lot of large families, you know, wanting to come to Belmont Abbey and have that kind of education. And because they had, you know, large families, they couldn't all afford to go to the private college. Mm -hmm. Even if, even with the lowered tuition, they couldn't afford to go. Sure. And so what they were doing is defaulting to the community <clears throat> college or maybe the state school saying, well, we, we would like what you have, but we just can't afford it. So I went back with everybody at the Abbey. I said, we got to think about a way. H how can we do this? I mean, I wish I could tell you that we had a huge endowment because if we did, I'd just let everybody come for nothing. Um, right. but, but I don't have that. I don't have an endowment. So I got to figure out how to really make this work because I got to be able to pay the bills like Mother Angel said, keep the lights on, you know, pay the electric and so forth. Um, so I, I started to look at it and I said, well, why couldn't we come up with a program that made use of Belmont Abbey at times that we're right now not using it as much? So for example, in the summers. So this year, we just started something called the Bishop Leo Hade Fellowship Program. And what it basically is, is that out of your eight semesters, two of them are online and six of them are residential. 
but you begin with the residential. So we just had our students in for the first time now, this whole summer, took a full course load. They live on campus, eat in the dining hall, they go to activities, they have a complete full college life. They're loving it, by the way. Um, they then have the fall and spring, the following fall and spring, they can do their core courses, at least some of them online, while they can also work, which would allow them to earn a little bit more money, which means they don't have to borrow as much money for colleges and those kinds of things. Sure, sure. They come back the following summer for the same thing. The first four semesters, which is the equivalent of your freshman and sophomore year, total with the residential component is $20,000. And that's before Pell Grants or any other grants are given. So really, you could, if you, got, if you qualified for a full Pell Grant, you could end up paying maybe the equivalent of like $3,000 a semester. Yeah. for the first four semesters. So I think we found a way of dramatically reducing the cost it for families. Uh, and hopefully that makes it affordable and I'm hoping that that will help parents not to make that hard choice between a Catholic education, a good solid Catholic education and going to a state school or a public school. Right, no, no I think that's uh, a very important thing. Um, I, I know in, in our economy, this is a huge problem. It's, mm -hmm. There's about a trillion dollars yes. of college debt that's now higher than any other debt. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And you know, and so people then say, well, is it worth it? You right. know, maybe, and this is a good thing. Now you call this the Hade? The, the ab, well, it's the Bishop, Bishop, the Bishop Leo Hade Fellowship Program. Um, who was he? Oh, well, ab, Abbot Leo Hade was also the first Bishop of all of North Carolina. Oh. I mean, Belmont Abbey is a story of divine providence. It, it's just, it's a remarkable place. Um, there was a, a Father Jeremiah O'Connell who was a Catholic priest down in Columbia, South Carolina, <coughs> and he had started a school down there. Uh, timing's everything. It was the Civil War. Sherman came through, destroyed Atlanta and most of Columbia, including Father Jeremiah's school. So he ended up coming up to Charlotte, uh, where his brother, a Catholic priest, was at the time. There was estimated to only be about 700 Catholics in the whole state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So Father Jeremiah rode circuit for the few scattered Catholics there. And this tract of land about 10 years after the Civil War is auctioned off. 700 acres auctioned off for back taxes. He puts a bid in on it, he loses, but shortly after they came back to him and said, the guy who won can't pay, you're still interested? He said, yes, he put down his $10 and he bought the 700 acres. And his whole intent was to give it to a religious order to come and have a school. He tried giving it to the Jesuits and the Redemptists and a host of others, and they all said, well, no, why would we go to North Carolina? There's no Catholics. Right. So God in his good humor, somehow this invitation goes to these German-speaking monks who have come from Bavaria up in Pennsylvania. They accept, they send down one monk, sight unseen, he picks up two students in Richmond on his way down. I don't know how this happens. They arrive on the property on April 21st, 1876, and they start class the day they arrive. There is nothing on that property when they arrive but two shacks with holes in the roof. And to this day, if you go to come to the Abbey, which I invite everybody to do, beautiful Gothic brick buildings. These monks dug up the red clay. They formed them into bricks. They dried them in the sun. They designed the buildings, and they built them almost over 140 years ago. It is remarkable. Yeah, but see, that's what a judge would expect out of Benedictines. <laughs> now, these yeah. are hardworking guys. Yeah. You know, that they, th that's what they've done over the centuries. Yes. They were self-sufficient in all ways. Yeah. Carpenters and electricians yeah. and farmers. And, you know, we had a farm there at one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, th so this is uh, good. And, you know, I, I think if you, uh, I'm going to tell people how to find out more about the uh, Bishop Hayde Fellowship Program. You can go to belmontabbeycollege.edu. So it's belmontabbeycollege.edu slash Haid, H-A-I-D, mm -hmm. fellowship, Haid Fellowship. And you can find out more about this because it's, um, it's a remarkable program mm -hmm. these days. Yeah, uh, and it, 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 it was kind of insane. I just I just saw higher education every year. You know, three, four, five, six percent was the increase in tuition. And it just yeah. kept, and it was going to go. And I said, when's it ever going to stop? I mean, you're going to be paying a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, w when would it ever end? So, uh, I don't see a lot of places changing. I mean, last year, for example, no. I think in North Carolina there was only, uh, I think, three out of the thirty-six privates that didn't raise their tuition. And you know, when when you think that, um, f especially for the middle class. Yeah. Wage earning power has, has decreased over right. the last seven, eight right. years. And people are not making as, they don't have as much right. to go around. So this, it's, it's a great strain. And gets, yeah. some people say, well, we just can't go to college or we can't have right. kids. And so oh, yeah, I can't say that. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and what we also did is we froze it. So we've guaranteed we're not going to raise it. 
Yeah. So you know that when you're coming in, it's not one of these things where you come in and then next year they tell you, oh, the tuition went up, oh, the tuition went up, oh, the tuition went up. So by the time you, you get more and more in debt and you're, you're having to pay more and more as you go, we've said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. If anything, I'm still looking for ways to lower our tuition. Yeah. If I had a big enough endowment, I'm, I, honestly, if I had a big enough endowment, I, I, w I could have everybody come there. And, and by the way, these schools that have huge endowments, a place like Belmont Abbey, if you, and this sounds like a lot of money, but if you had, a, a, let's say, a $350 million endowment, just about everybody could come for free and just pay what they could pay, and no debt, zero debt. Um, schools that have these billion dollar endowments could easily do this, but they, that's not the structure, that's not the way they're working. Yeah, I know, I, I, I don't really understand all of it. Um, there's some, it sounds like there's some sort of economic monkey business going on that keeps raising, but that's another issue. The, um, the thing that I think is, important is a you can try to make this affordable but far more important is this focus on helping the students to see faith and reason mm -hmm. thinking yeah. and believing going together how do they respond I and mean, we hear a lot of how millennials are you know the young people who are mm -hmm. in college today that they're losing interest in religion and faith in general. How does that work over at Belmont Abbey? I don't see that happening. Uh, if anything, I see students becoming more in tune with what really matters. And they're, they're coming to see their true happiness lies in something more profound or deeper than, you know, the material things of the world. Those things can be goods, obviously. But, yeah. but that, that's not what truly satisfies. And one of the things I, I find about Belmont Abbey College students that is remarkable to me, and I, I would challenge anybody to come to our campus, stop anybody, stop any student you want walking along. And I can tell you this, what everybody tells me, they come into me and they're almost shocked. They go, your students here, they're, they're, they're incredible. I, I had the greatest conversation. They, they were so polite and we, I, I, I'm thinking, well, what did you expect they would do, you know? But, but our students are incredibly balanced. Have you seen balanced. videos of people walking on other campuses? I have. And asking questions of students? I, I have, I have. We, you know, yeah, uh, that, that between the bleeps uh, that go yeah. on when they report this, you know, you get a lot of anger and stuff. Yeah. Uh, no. You don't get that? No, and, and, and the balance is what I'm amazed at. I didn't have this balance when I was going to college, but the, the balance of our students is remarkable. They have spiritual lives, they have extracurricular activities, they have their intellectual pursuit with the academics, and so there's this great balance. And I'm also incredibly impressed with their, their friendships. Mm -hmm. Now, you make friendships anywhere, I get that, right? Yeah. But I have never seen friendships like at Belmont Abbey College. I mean, if one of your children had just one of the friends that I've seen, like my daughter have there, you'd, you'd think you're blessed. You'd say, this is incredible, my daughter has this as a friend. They have 15, 20 like that. And the number of marriages that, that begin, you know, the relationship begin there, and that, you know, turns to marriages after they graduate, I can't believe the numbers. Um, so, so it's very hopeful for the future. I mean, you yeah. have just really great young men and women uh, who are really trying to double their talents. You know, the Matthew 25, 14 to 30. You know, they're, they're really trying to double what they have in all ways. Uh, and again, uh, on the whole, I mean, nothing's perfect, right? But on the whole, just good, good, good people. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is something that is um, going on, certainly in other campuses uh, around the nation. Mm -hmm. You know, we see places like Steubenville that's well sure, known in sure. Catholic circles. Yeah. But it, uh, and uh, another, you know, the uh, Benedictine College out in, out in Atchison, Kansas. I'm good Atchison. friends with Steve Menace, who's the president right? there. Right, they're, yeah. they're experiencing something similar. Yes. That, that full integration mm -hmm. of Catholic faith and solid learning f brings out a great some great qualities in students yes. at all these gap yeah. campuses. And Thomas Aquinas and Ave Maria, these are yeah. places that you, you see a flourishing of faith, thought, morals uh, right. being integrated. And, and it's, I'm good friends, but you know, we're obviously pretty close because we're all sharing a similar way. We all have our unique charisms and ways about yeah. going about doing it, but we, see, we share a lot of that. Uh, and, and I've I've just seen, the, I think the reason it's happening, and what's amazing is right now in higher ed, what you're hearing is that enrollments are dropping everywhere. Mm -hmm. People are really worried about their enrollment levels. Last year was an all-time record of new number of students coming into Belmont Abbey College, and this year it's almost 15 or 20 percent higher than last year. Uh -huh. so, so last year was the largest in our history. This yeah. year is going to crush last year's largest in our history coming yeah. in. So there are more and more students attracted 
to what they're finding at the Abbey. And most people visit the Abbey, I think something like 60% of the students that visit us enroll. Yeah. Uh, because they come and you're immediately drawn to the place and the other students. And that's really, in the end, you can put anything in marketing materials or have like a brochure and so forth. It's when they meet the other students, and they find out what's really going on and what's really happening. They say, wow, this, th these are good people. These yeah. are the kind of people I want to be friends with. Right, right. And I, I think, um, you know, to, for parents to know that Finally, there's a place I can send my students mm -hmm. where the faculty won't be manipulating grades to force, the, to mm -hmm. indoctrinate and, you know, use propaganda right. against our faith mm -hmm. and morals. Right. That's, that's a big issue. Well, just to give you an example, we have our, our faculty and community staff retreat coming up here in just, I think it's next week. Uh, the theme of it is Ex Corte Ecclesiae. Mm -hmm. And Abbot Placid begins by... Which is, is so folks oh, I'm sorry. Is, yeah. Ex Corte Ecclesiae is, a, is the, uh, it's an apostolic constitution written by St. John Paul II, which was basically, the, the, the words stand for, from, born from the heart of the church. Right. And basically what it does is it lays out what it means to actually be a Catholic college or university. And I, that you come from the heart yes, of the church? Yeah. And that you're not over against the church. But right. the, the Catholic church invented the university. Yes. And if you read this document, I challenge anybody to read it and, and really to find anything to oppose in it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful document. And by the way, it welcomes everybody. I mean, Belmont Abbey is Benedictines. We're in the middle of the Bible Belt, right? We welcome everybody. We welcome in persona Christi as Christ. Come on and we love you. Whoever you are, whatever your background, whatever your faith, come on in. But the reason we can do that is because of what we believe. Right. So it's, you know, this ex corte ecclesia is very clear about, you know, where do other people fit that are not Catholic or come from other backgrounds and traditions. Um, sure, respect, love, you know, come in. But it's clear of who we are and what we stand for and what motivates us, you know, for the good work that hopefully we're doing. Yeah. And you also had done a, a book. We mentioned it, you know, yes. uh, called Less Than a Minute to Go, The Secret to World Class Performance and Sport Business and Everyday Life. Um, does that come into play in the way that you deal, speaking of play, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, what goes on at the college? Absolutely. I mean, we have, uh, we have 29 varsity sports teams, men and women. Mm -hmm. um, and today, people when they hear sport, the first thing they think is, ooh, you know, sport. You know, you know, we, I, see the, I see the poster child for vice, you know, yeah. envy, sloth, anger, greed, lust. I mean, the whole, it's all in there, right? Yeah. Um, but what we're, what we're failing to see, and especially this is an important message, I think, for Catholics to understand, is that we were made to play. Matter of fact, I, I was shocked. What do you mean we're made to play? God made us to play. Uh, it's in, it, think about this idea. Every human being from the beginning of time has played. That, that's a remarkable thought. And I wish I could claim your scholarship. I mean, you're a genius. And uh, I, wish, I, I wish I had a fraction of what you have. Um, you know, to put it in perspective, when I went to the University of Maryland, they told me my major was eligibility. You know, so so, so that, that gives you an idea. But, but I'll tell you what, I was curious. And I started to do some research, and I was shocked. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. I, I could go on. St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, St. Francis de Sales, St. Augustine, as a boy I played ball games. I mean, Plato in 386 BC said, for those who change the sports are secretly changing the manners of the young, for the old to be dishonored and the young to be honored. You know, then we can go to scripture, Corinthians. St. Paul was from Tarsus. They had a palestra there, you know, so they, he understood sport. He understood the reason I, he used those analogies is because he right. understood the people would relate to them. Right. Proverbs 8 talks about wisdom playing before God, playing day after day. I was God's delight. This thing, play, has the same capacity as great cathedrals or art to raise us up and have us contemplate God. Play is supposed to be done for its own sake. It's not done for some mean and artificial end. The reason we're having such problem with sport today is because it's being done as more of a selfish work. Um, work is not bad, but a selfish work is bad. And yeah, that's when, the problem. When, you, when you're trying to make yourself a multimillionaire and things, and which a few people get to, but right. it beca that becomes this impossible thing. And, and you, you, I don't find myself all that impressed with some of the characters who get so much money that they, um, you know, get. And whereas some characters, there was that one football player who had great character. Tim Tebow? Yeah, right? Tim yeah, Tebow. Yeah. You know, uh, a fine Christian man. I, and he gets mocked. But I will tell you this. I have worked with hundreds of professional athletes and... And I'm talking about first round picks. I'm talking yeah. about people who start in Super Bowls, yeah. you know. 
You never hear about them. They're the greatest people in the world. You'd love to be friends with them. They're great Christians, great fathers, great husbands. Yeah. You just never hear about them. Yeah. It's the media, the mainstream media that focuses on all the negatives, the drugs, the shootings. They always pick out the bad things and it, and it affects That's the culture. True. You're right. And then it affects college and affects high school and it's down to a youth level and even the fans now in the stands are more work related almost when they're there. It's as, as one commentator I heard said, perhaps the press and Hollywood emphasizes those things so they can project outward what their own lives are like, but we'll see. Yeah. We have to take a break. Uh, we're gonna come back in a couple of minutes. We wanna get your questions and comments about edu Catholic education or Belmont College or this issue of play and sport, as well as questions from our studio audience. So please stay with us. First of all, I'd like to invite all of you to come and join us. If you can make a pilgrimage down here to EW10, like these very nice folks have come all the way from New Jersey and New York. And we have, uh, well, you'll talk to one of the guests who's going to ask a question. Came, she wins the long distance award tonight. But, you know, we'd love to have you come and join us in our studio audience. If you can, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to EWTN.com and they'll give you information about the scheduling of programs you can be in the audience as well as the schedule for masses and the uh, directions up to Hansville to visit the sisters and all that. And also we want to remind you that you uh, may want to take a look at the Newman Guide to Catholic Colleges. The Newman Society, Cardinal Newman Society, uh, gives a lot of information about Catholic colleges. Uh, they have a new edition for 2016 to 17, mm -hmm. and it's called the Newman Guide to Choosing a Catholic College. And uh, you can go online to the CardinalNewmanSociety.org and find out more from them. Mm -hmm. You ready for some questions? Absolutely. That'd be Giddy great. up. Yeah. All right, uh, we have Thomas on the line. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine, thanks. Where are you from? Kingsport, Tennessee. Oh, good to have you. Oh, which reminds me, Thomas, let me interrupt you for a second. Sure. I want Go to ahead. make a clarification. I've been using interchangeably Belmont Abbey College and Belmont College. Belmont College is in the great state of Tennessee. In Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville, Tennessee. I used to live a couple of blocks away from there, and yes. so it, I, 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 I still say I Belmont. Lived in Nashville for, I lived in Nashville for 10 years, Father. Did you? Well, uh, I, now I'm up in the upper east corner of Tennessee. All right. Well, I, right, I, yeah. I want to make that clarification before we go on sure. so that we're talking tonight about Belmont Abbey College, though the other right. one's a fine college, too. Right. But it is good, that's good, not, music, good music school. Exactly. Well, yes. Thomas, what is your question? Okay, Father. Uh, I had a question for Dr. Tierfelder. Sure. Uh, Dr. Tierfelder, how do you plan on keeping your uh, Belmont uh, authentically Catholic? And, and here's, my, here's my question or, or statement, actually. Uh, and I say this with truth and charity. Sure. Uh, we have many colleges, Catholic colleges and universities in the United States today uh, inviting uh, politicians and speakers 
to come to their colleges and universities. And these, these uh, politicians and speakers have views and beliefs which are in conflict with Catholic doctrine. Uh, could you uh, please address that? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and the way you stay Catholic is on a lot of levels. Uh, I'll, I'll start with your speaker one. It's interesting. Uh, we're probably one of the few, if may, I don't know if we're the only, uh, college that at our commencement, we don't have a speaker. Uh, we usually invite you know, a bishop or a cardinal uh, or a priest to come and, and be the celebrant of the baccalaureate mass and the homily serves as the baccalaureate address. Um, so th there's some, some safety in doing that, but it, it's prayer and we have a monastery there and there's prayer starting at six o'clock in the morning, 7.30, midday prayer, mass, you know, vespers. There's prayer there 24 seven, 365. So we are praying to begin with and there is a community there. And you also are getting ready to, you're, you're starting a uh, Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. We have it already. We have a okay. St. Joseph Adoration Chapel, which uh, we've, we put in place maybe about eight years ago. It's in, right in the center of our campus. Jesus Christ is the center of the college. We don't, that's not just words, that, that's real. Uh, we also are starting a college seminary next year, St. Joseph's College Seminary. Uh, but to your point, it's, it's on all levels. So it's following Ex Corte Ecclesiae, uh, our Articles of Incorporation as a college have the four main principles that Ex Corte Ecclesia has in them, in the, in the incorporation of the college. So it's, it's having a, a uh, majority of Catholic faculty. It's, it's, an, it's on so many different planes and levels. It's the, you know, it's the grace of God. I mean, we're, you know, obviously we continue to pray nonstop for the grace of God. I'm praying to Mother Angelica too, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, for her intercession. It's all of these things that go in, in terms of keeping you, you know, a solidly Catholic and grounded place. Good. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks for your question, Thomas. It's, it's a, a real crisis situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in some of the Catholic colleges, the religious orders that were entrusted with them lost control due to federal government intervention mm -hmm. in 1966, mm -hmm. where they reduced the founding members of the orders to only one third of the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they, they confiscate them. And a lot of times the religious orders uh, go along with the de-Catholicization of mm -hmm. the schools. Sometimes they have no control. Right. And other for, the faculty has more control over choosing faculty members mm -hmm. than yeah. do the religious. And, and in our case, uh, the, the monastic community has reserved power. So Belmont Abbey College Incorporated the members of Belmont Abbey College Incorporated are the professed monks of Belmont Abbey. Uh -huh. And they have the right to refusal of the president uh, and they could dissolve the board. So, so there, there's a lot there to ensure that mm -hmm. the foundation and the leadership and our right. Catholicity are always maintained in there. And, and as I said, Abbott Plaza is our leader. We were the first to sue the federal government over the HHS mandate. Yeah. Uh, and that came from an initial discussion with Abbott Plaza and myself. And he said, before I could say anything, he said, I think we need to sue, sue the federal government. I said, I'm right with you. Let, let's go. And we went to the board. The board was completely on with that. And that, that's what we did. So we so find it, ourselves. Which indicates that you're more committed to Catholic morality than to governmental imposition Absolutely. of sin. Absolutely. When we, the government we, tries to impose mortal sin on us, right. you say, no, we're going to be right. Catholic. And I had to already go and get the exemption to the gender exemption to Title IX, uh, where now gender is considered a protected you know, class. And obviously, from a Catholic perspective, we, we can't do that. Right. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we're doing to make sure you know, and ensure that uh, you know, Jesus Christ is the center of the college. Uh, you know, we're, we're an academic, we're a college, but at the same time, there's a reason why we're doing this. I mean, to be honest with you, if Jesus Christ wasn't the center of this college, I'd be gone in a second. Yep. Okay. I have a question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, I'm from New Jersey, Father. Great. And what's your question? My question to Dr. Terfelder is, um, if I want my child to go to um, Belmont Abbey, mm -hmm. how much would uh, uh, my child's uh, SAT score okay. be? And second, for the first year of uh, the school year, mm -hmm. how much do I need to save based on the assumption that I don't want a student loan? Okay. And number two, we will be out of state because we come from New Jersey and we're going to Carolina. Right. Okay, first is the, the SAT scores. Um, our average SAT score is a little over 1,000. It might be like 1050, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, our Honors Institute is very high. It might be, you know, 1350 or above, you know, to get into that. Usually the GPA, again, average is, is probably about 3.2 or 3.3 GPA to get in. 
We also, today we're finding there's also a, a, a great number of learning disabilities, uh, you know, documentable learning disabilities. Yeah. And so, yeah. so sometimes we, we also work with individuals in that regard as well. And we also have found that um, uh, with, the, with the SAT scores that they're not always a perfect indication of how someone's going to perform. Uh, actually, they have a pretty low correlation. And so we, we actually accept students without an SAT. Uh, you know, they, they interview, they'll have uh, their GPAs and so forth, but they don't necessarily have to take the SAT. Okay. Uh, and then there, the, the yeah, other... Twisha, how much would it cost? If, uh, walk in the door and start going to class. What, is, what does she need to provide for her okay. child to be there? Um, the, the Hague program is different than the regular tuition. So if we start with regular tuition, again, it's going to depend on your circumstances to like what we give you as merit aid. So depending on your SAT and your GPA, you'll, you'll get a merit award that will be to affect. greater or larger sizes that will affect that number. I would say on average, the tuition total for the year is probably around $12,000, and that's before grants. So if you qualify for any kind of grants, we have no difference for out of state. So it doesn't cost more for out of state than, than yeah. for in state. Yeah. So you can be from any country or any right. state. Same that's class. right. Yeah. It's not like a state college. Yeah. Okay. We have Patrick on the line. Patrick, where are you ca calling from? I'm calling from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Great. Wow. Oh, uh, do you have any chocolate? Um, well, I actually work at Hershey Chocolate World, so... That's, <laughs> that's uh, not what I asked. I want to see the chocolate. If, if you want to come over, I can get you some. <laughs> okay. I get a discount, so... <laughs> Dark chocolate is on my diet. That's okay. Is so, it? All right. <laughs> so, Patrick, what can we do for you today? Oh, uh, well, I have a question for Dr. Therfelter. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk about, um, you know, I've been on, I'm actually an incoming freshman in about two weeks. I'm excited to be there. Um, really can't wait. I've been on campus, of course, before. It's, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the grotto and, and some of the history there and, and maybe touch upon um, how, you know, your balance between faith and sports and how it kind of permeates within the sports realm. Okay. okay. Good. Uh, Great question, Patrick. I, I'll start with the grotto. It's an amazing story. Going back to divine providence. Um, there was a monk who was dying of typhoid fever. I think it was in the early 1890s. And, uh, all, and he was literally on death's doorstep. And uh, the monks prayed to Our Lady of Fatima and said, you know, if you'll spare... No, not Our Lady of Fatima. I, I, Our Lady of uh, Lady Lord. Of, uh, Lord sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, we prayed to Lady Fatima too, but yeah, but you know, not in 1890. No, uh, yeah, they, to Our Lady of, uh, of Lords, and they said, you know, if you'll heal her, we'll we'll build a grotto. If you yeah. heal him, we'll build a grotto. And he was, uh, whether you want to say miraculously healed or whatever, instantaneously the next day he's better, and they actually built a grotto. So we have a grotto of Lords in right behind the monastery that anybody you know is free to go to pray rosary, and yeah. uh, it's it's beautiful. Uh, on the sports side. You know, sport and virtue, very often when I say those two words together, people think there's a choice to be made. You know, world-class performance or sport and virtue, somehow being a good person, like as if they're mutually exclusive. Um, at Belmont Abbey, we see great performance, whatever that is, as one virtue, but we're looking for all the other virtues. And as we all know, the virtues work in combination with each other. And so really that's the essence and the foundation. I'll share this one quote with you. It's my favorite quote on sport. It goes like this, sport, properly directed, develops character, makes a man courageous, a generous loser, and a gracious victor. It refines the senses, gives intellectual penetration, and steals the will to endurance. It is not just a physical development then. Sport properly understood is an occupation of the whole man. And while developing the body is an instrument of the mind, it also perfects the mind for the search and communication of truth so that in all things God may be glorified. I mean, that's, that's basically a quote, and it's by Pope Pius XII called Sport at the Service of the Spirit. Uh, Do you think that we could get that instead of these debates between the candidates? Yes. You know, have them start what playing yeah. teams and learning some, you know, yes. teamwork right. and sportsmanship and all that good stuff? Yeah. That, I, might, be, that might be a good alternative. I, absolutely. But that, that, is what, that should be the foundation, the mission of every, certainly Catholic, yeah. you know, sports organization. Right. Uh, but again, there's no trade-off here. You can be a world-class athlete and be virtuous <laughs> in Absolutely. all of the ways. And that should be, and I'll tell you, it's on us. We need to demand and expect that from sport. 
at whatever level we're looking at. And if we did, we would change the culture in the world. It's just that we're not, we're not demanding it. We're either rejecting and saying, well, I don't want anything to do with sport, or you're accepting and saying, well, I don't like all the stuff that's in it, but what are you gonna do? It's just the way it is. We've gotta stop that. We've gotta take back sport and make it what it was intended to be. And when we see some of the sports gossip programs, right. which is what they sometimes end up sure. becoming, yeah. um, and the news programs, we need to tell the yes. people, well, you know, the, should we expect a baseball player to be a good role model for our youth or not? You know, this is right. a question. No, it's not a question. It's not a question. It's, it's a fact. not a question. Yep. Yeah. And so we want to see those good role right. models and tell them, you know, that if they're too ignorant to figure that out, tell them yourself as right. an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Let them know. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, where are you coming from? Yeah. Well, I'm living in Kuwait right now. Wow. See, I told yeah. you she wins the long distance. <laughs> Got the long That's board. a long commute. Yeah, Kuwait yeah. is Pretty long commute, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what's your question? Well, I'm a college lecturer there at, oh. a, at a women's college, actually. And so, um, and as a Catholic, you know, mm. myself, I was just curious, and you sort of answered the question yeah. a little bit that you have, you know, a significant mm. college faculty, but I was just, so then, you know, to sort of take it further, we teach, um, we have performance criteria that are part of each course and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious how you would weave in Catholic teachings into each of your courses. Are there certain, you know, points that must be hit in order to, you know, clarify that it's a, a you know, Catholic curriculum, if you will. Right. Good question. It is a good question. I think uh, it depends on what field you're talking about. So like in biology, you know, we bring in, uh, you know, Dr. Grattan Brown, who's a bioethicist, you know, to come in and talk about. So there's a crossover there of theology into biology so our students can understand what those other issues might be. I, I think with all, with all of this, the challenge is making sure that you have faculty, and, and I believe we do, who have come, who are excellent teachers, but they've come for the vision and mission of the college, and they're there to support it. One of, the, one of the, I guess, unique things about the Abbey, which is unlike maybe some of the other you know, schools in the Newman Guide, is that we're in the middle of the Bible Belt. And so there's, I think the whole state of North Carolina is only 4% Catholic. Um, so it's about the same here as in Alabama. Right. So, you know, all, all, this is how God works, right? He puts EWTN here and he puts Belmont Abbey College there, but with the, same, with the same intent, I think. In other words, we're called to be light. We're called to welcome in. We're called to live our Catholic faith, not to hide ourselves or, or, or you know, protect ourselves and somehow. We're, we're called to give, you know, reason for our hope, you know, 1 Peter 3.15. Mm -hmm. uh, and to do that through the way that we live and the way we love people. And that's why I go back to the welcoming of in persona Christi. So we welcome everybody in. So regardless of your faith, we welcome you in. So we have many people that are not of the Catholic faith that work at the college, but everybody that's at the college thoroughly understands we're a Catholic college. Matter of fact, the, the analogy I often use, I said, you know, if you and I were going over to a Jewish person's home for dinner tonight, and we knock on the door, and they open the door, and the man has a yarmulke on, and there's some other signs of their Jewish faith inside, never in a million years would you and I stand outside that house and say, I I'm sorry, we can't come in until you remove all those things. We'd go into the house, we'd have a nice dinner, we might talk about faith, we might not. At the end of the night, we'd say, thank you so much for having us, and we'd be on our way. It would be crazy of us to think they've changed. So what I've said is, if you're coming to Belmont Abbey College, you're coming to a Catholic home. Right. So you, you gotta, I tell people, if you, if, you don't, if you hate Catholics, if you hate Catholic homes, then you definitely shouldn't come to Belmont Abbey, but we're so happy for you to come. We're happy to welcome you into our home. Yeah. Um, and you, we don't force you to hold a rosary as you no, walk on campus. No. But you can't, you know, snatch rosaries out of no, the people who are. No, no, no. Yeah, and and again, you know, I, I see uh, conversions. I leave those to God, right? But I, but I see conversions, and and so I'm amazed at, you know, one of our, uh, I won't say her name, but, um, you know, someone who had worked at the college for 18 years at the time came into me one day and said, you know, Dr. Theofilder, I'm converting to the Catholic faith. And I thought. Wow, I mean, first thing I was thinking is, why did it take 18 years, you know? And then I'm thinking of, well, St. Augustine took 19, you know? So, yeah. I mean, she's ahead, yeah. uh, you know, of St. Augustine. But it, but it just, it, it, it's in God's time, and it's through our, our model and our example and the fact that we love people and that we exemplify what it means to be Catholic. And I think that has the greatest chance of evangelizing the world and changing the culture. Yeah. And so, again, it's, it's welcoming of all, but certainly St. John Paul II talked about next Cordia Ecclesiae. You need a solid majority of your, of your faculty to be Catholic because it's very difficult to maintain a culture uh, of those even good-willed people who don't understand or believe or participate in, in the faith. And, you know, another point that I remember as a contrast between a Catholic approach 
and uh, a very secular approach. I, I met a uh, student, his father invited me to give a lecture at his parish, um, and the student was in Latin classes at a state university. Mm -hmm. And he was, he asked his father and me for some help. And so we said, oh, here's the subject and here's the direct object and here's the verb and it's, it, and we went through, mm -hmm. and he said, how did you know that? I said, well, we just studied. But what, we, what the father and I didn't know was the vocabulary because his professor, thinking that a way to keep the students interested was reading smutty, oh. dirty plays. Oh. Of which there are plenty in yeah. Roman literature. Sure. So he said, well, if I keep them talking, you know, it was translating the smutty stuff. Whereas we studied what Augustine did, Cicero mm -hmm. and Virgil. Mm -hmm. And we understood how that helped develop philosophy right. and such. And that would be a, that'd be a clear difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have another caller. Hello, Joanne. Oh, hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Montana. Great. We love you in Montana, Father. Oh, thank you so much. I, I've been to Montana. I love it back. It is <laughs> oh, beautiful out there. It is. It's yeah. the best place. What's your question tonight, Joanne? Um, well, I would just like to make a comment and a small little question. Um, to Dr. Bill, um, he has a wonderful sounding college. I wish I would have known about it 50 years ago. But um, my question is, do you have co-ed dorms there? Do you no, have co-ed dorms? No, we, we, they're separate. So we have men's residence halls, women's residence halls. Um, and, and we, again... And they can both meet at the chapel. <laughs> 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 to get married, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, again, it's the understanding. It's just, Saint, I keep going back to St. John Paul II, and he was a wonderful saint uh, for our lives. But, you know, in his Theology of the Body, uh, it, it lays out really the deep and profound understanding of... of Christian Catholic sexuality and relationship and person. Um, and so it's important that our students also come to understand the dignity of, of the human person and of each other and the complementarity of both men and women. Yeah, uh, yeah. But again, so we have, you know, there's visitation, you know, all, all of these kind of things, the parietals, those kinds of things uh, are in place in order to help you know, create give some guidance. To give some guidance. Yes. yes. Yeah. You know, and, and I, when it comes to that area, I like to uh, people to think of an image. You know, you know the difference between the Everglades and the Mississippi. What? They're both rivers. Yes. The Everglades don't have any banks, mm -hmm. so it looks like a swamp, even though it's a river. Mm -hmm. While the Mississippi has banks, it's navigable, and you can mm -hmm. uh, have ships going through. Right. Having guidance, mm -hmm. like the banks of a river, give you shape and form. Right. Whereas without those kind of guiding principles, mm -hmm. you end up with a swamp. Uh, or it lo looks like a swamp. Right. And we don't want that. I, I, I agree with you completely. And, uh, yeah. and it, again, it's about um, because you're, you're making this transition into independence and adulthood, and it's important that you learn how to do that as well, because yeah. it's, you, know, you don't want to just sort of get cut off one day and suddenly say, well, how do I have relationships and what should they be? I mean, it's important to understand those and develop and become to that mature uh, uh, understanding of you know, men and women relationships and what right. does it all mean. Right, and that's an important part of education. Yes. That again is part of the integration of the whole person, not right. just right. Reading Shakespeare right. and reading about Romeo and Juliet, but also understanding how men and women relate in a way that's better than suicide. Right. <laughs> yes. Like Romeo and Juliet. Yes, yes. yes. We uh, want to make sure that we get some of this information. It's Belmont Abbey College. And if you want to find out more about it, you can go to their website, which is Belmont Abbey College. Dot E D U, or you can call there at 704-461-6700. And if you're in the area of Belmont, North Carolina, we love you. Come on in. Come on in. Yeah. This is, this is Southern hospitality That's here, right. Baba. It's, come on. You, know, yeah. you just come on yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell your mom and them. Uh, yeah. It's a beautiful place. I mean, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. It it's peaceful. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it is very, it's a beautiful area. And we're so close to Charlotte. I mean, it's, the, it's kind of the amazing thing is it's a beautiful campus. You got the Gothic brick structures and yet you're 15 minutes from uptown Charlotte. Yep, and which is a, another very pretty city too. It is, yeah. Great Bishop, you know. Yes, yeah. Bishop Jugas is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, good man. Yes. Well, I want to thank you oh, for, my gosh. For, for coming and, and joining us here. Thank oh, you. It's, it's great to, to it's, it's good news. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, starting a new se college seminary. Yeah, that's this exciting. Good news. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we like hearing that. And so thank you yeah. for the work thank you're you. doing. Thank you for your work. And I want to leave all of you with a blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all your ways by his peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as Dr. Therfelder mentioned, you know, Mother always was concerned about, you know, keeping the lights on, <laughs> um, you know, and especially in the summertime, because I know a lot of you travel, go on vacation, but our bill collectors don't take summer vacations. They are persistent. So we ask that, you know, especially at this season, you do keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill and your cable bill and we'll pay all of our bills too. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.